everyone, we have a pre-notification for a 34-year-old male with multiple GSWs to the neck and chest. The patient is hypotensive and tachycardic. Everyone, please introduce yourselves. Mike, survey resident. Tar and blood runner and C-spine. I'm Heidi, primary nurse. Naomi, trauma team leader. I'm Brenda. Everyone knows their assigned roles. And we have a plan for what we're gonna do. We'll notify the operating room if we have to go upstairs. Patient's hypotensive. Can you get the Belmont ready to transfuse yeah. two We're units? Behind you. Let's, let's hear our vital signs. Check our inside. We have vitals 80 over 40, heart rate of 110. Mike, give us a breath sound. I'm just panting. Mike, you going with sucks? Okay. Breath sound yeah. on the left side. I have no sound on the right. Yeah. Naomi, what am I looking at? Our chest x ray shows that the patient has uh, the resolution of the pneumothorax on the right side. Huh? So, we got a bullet? We don't see a bullet. Okay. Chop, chop. Go, go. Let's go. go Let's go. get ready to log roll the patient again. To What's the status the... of the operating? From the trauma surgeon's perspective, bullets were all about real estate. Location, location, location. Our pelvic x ray shows that we have a projectile in the left pelvis. That means that our. We get all our. This is Temperman. We're heading up for a neck exploration of immediately exploratory laparotomy. Let's make sure that the patient's hypertensive, the pure anesthesia coming up high. I want to shoot one more x ray of the neck before we go to Negative. see if there's any further. Negative. Let's go. Okay. Very good. Checklist complete. Let's roll. All right. Take them off the vent. Clear the way. Clear One back. of the reasons why we don't have 50,000 dead or 60,000 dead in America is that we have organized a wonderful trauma system. And we've been honing it for years. All right, everybody. I just want to thank you guys all for participating in today's simulation. Uh, it's obviously an ongoing effort to keep on practicing, taking care of these really sick patients. I just want to go over a good proper debrief on exactly what happened in the scenario and how you guys all uh, thought you guys went. Yeah, so thank you. The first guys. layer is you have to have a trauma system, you have to have an EMS system. So things have to be in place in terms of the medicine long before someone takes a bullet. The more of this we do, the better will we be in the real world. Whatever walks into the door, we're all going to band together and we're all going to get it done. Hold in three at this time. Ascend and Narco, 1204 Gilbert, please. 68 complainant. In 2009, I was working late. It was the evening. And a call came over the radio that we had a 92-year-old woman that had been shot. It was a level one activation. She was on the way to our trauma center. And she comes in. She was this really elegant elderly woman. You know, she was your grandmother. And the story is that she was home in her living room. Gang members were having a fight. And a stray bullet had gone through her living room or bedroom window as she was preparing dinner. So I um, began the operation. And, you know, as predicted, the bullet had come across the midline and it had injured everything that's important for life. But we tried. And we, we dumped the hospital into her, blood and people, and we tried. So it's, it's done, you know, we, we, her lifeblood is poured out all over the floor and all over me, and her heart stops, and we try to get her back, and I look up at the clock and pronounce her dead. And then I lose it. I just sat down right there, covered in her blood, and I started to cry. Man, did I cry. Never happened to me before. And Sadie Mitchell was just, I don't know, it was just too much. It just said to me that this country had an illness that maybe we were just never gonna get better from. It just epitomized how messed up this thing was, this scourge of gun violence. Temple has the dubious distinction of treating the most gunshot victims in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, an X-ray of the left uh, lower extremity. What's this? Oh, that is. Uh... Were you shot before ever, sir? 
a year to go, yes. Well, you shot at that, yeah. In the trauma bay, there are no good guys or bad guys. They're all patients that have sustained gunshot wounds that we need to, to take care of. And over the years, there's no doubt that every patient that hits the trauma bay has somebody that loves them. So I never pass any judgment. I never want to know anything at all about the circumstances of the shooting. Not at all. I quickly look at the patient and look at the heart rate. Heart rate can tell you everything. And, and a good trauma surgeon will tell you that the color of a patient's feet can tell you everything. Because if they're really pale, then that's a terrible prognostic indicator. That means that they're bleeding terribly. I think one of the biggest misunderstandings in kind of the lay non-medical population is, did you remove the bullet? You know, really what our jobs are is to fix all the damage that the bullets do. You know, whether it's stop the bleeding, whether it's take out the organs, it's, it's the fixing of those organs. It's not necessarily looking for the bullets and removing them. It's just trying to catch up to what, the, you know, the destruction uh, that the bullets have done. And what we have seen over the years from 1993 to 2019 is that the caliber of the bullet is so much larger and the kinetic energy and the destruction that these bullets can do are so great. And, you know, patients aren't shot just once or twice or three times. You know, they're shot like 10 and 11 and 12 times and more. When you're in the operating room, particularly with a, a gunshot victim, and they have a multitude of injuries, it can really be a slugfest. That's how I feel in the operating room. You know, God, you know, way to go, you're a good trauma surgeon. The devil, you suck, you call yourself a trauma surgeon, what are you doing here? And I had really struggled for all those years to understand what that was all about. And that's exactly what it is. God and the devil on your shoulder. All trauma team members respond back on a video only for a level one activation. So uh, we just finished the case, but we have another gunshot wound that's coming here. Yeah. Being brought in by police. We're done. We're done. We're done. Yep, we did good. We have another gunshot will come in. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's going to CAT scan first. And get to the Not yet. We don't know yet. Yeah. We don't. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Shot. Two times in the right chest and once in the right neck, and the BBs are where he is. Shot. Got shot. Uh, you know, piece yeah. of shrapnel in there. Yeah, and the jugular looks okay. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the floor of his mouth doesn't look so. And there's shrapnel extending all the way up to his tongue. Okay. So, see anything lodged in the palate or anything like? That? Yeah, I mean that's what like these little tiny guys. Yeah, but nothing larger. But nothing larger. I mean, I suspect it's was it like a buckshot or something? No, or? it was a big bullet. Oh, it was a big. He's bullet. big wound in the right neck. Huh. It's bullet. a large caliber. We have one hole, right. and we're looking for a bullet. I think that's in his top. He was shot two times in his right thigh, two times in his right chest. It looks like both of those injuries were relatively superficial, in that we don't think that there was any bones broken in the right thigh or any arteries or veins injured. In the right chest, we don't think that the bullets entered the chest, so we don't think that the lung was injured. He was also shot in the right neck, and the bullet looks like it may have lodged in his tongue. It's always very ironic because we sometimes say that these patients are lucky. I don't know how you could think that a patient that gets shot one, two, three, four, five times with a bullet in his neck, uh, in his tongue is lucky, but that's what we say. 
that he's lucky. In the moment, it's all about taking care of the patient and the focus needs to be intense and you can't be distracted by anything. And then when the moment passes, you need to be distracted by everything because you, you can't walk away not feeling that what you've just participated in in some way is so wrong. You don't want to be taking care of patients who've suffered gunshot wounds. My name is Scott Charles. I'm the Trauma Outreach Coordinator. Um, and I work with victims of gun violence. And that's essentially all I do. Out of curiosity, do any of you know somebody who's been shot? With a show of hands, how many of you know somebody who's been shot? Do any of you live with somebody who's been shot? Okay. So the reason why Scott and I wanted to create a program like Cradle to Grave was we felt that we needed to do more, like preventing these patients from coming in. We saw it as an education in that who knows better what bullets do to bodies than those that work in a hospital. My job is not to freak you out, um, but we are going to have a candid conversation about gun violence. Is that cool? And we thought it was our responsibility to do that. If we weren't talking, then the students were seeing what was happening in movies or video games or TV, and that was not real at all. The goal of Cradle to Grave was to really humanize the experience of, of gun violence, um, to, to de-glamorize it in many ways. I want to introduce you to Dr. Amy Goldberg, who is the chair of surgery here. And so she's going to walk us through what she and her colleagues do in this space when she ends up with a gunshot victim. And we're going to talk about Lamont and all the things that were done in an effort to save his life. Lamont is going to have a bullet wound right here. He's going to have a bullet wound right there. He's going to have a bullet wound right there. When Lamont came in, as Scott said, the first thing that we did was to make sure that we take off all of his clothes and everything so we can identify where the injuries are and we can start thinking about what has been injured. And when we first evaluate him, he's not breathing at all. And the first thing that we needed to do was put a breathing tube in his mouth so that we were able to breathe for him. This issue of gun violence isn't really as much about living it or dying as much as it is about suffering. And we find that particularly when you talk about one of the things that leads to so much of the violence, the sense of being disrespected, the sense of shame that lies at the heart of so much of the violence that we see, the kids after seeing the realities of being shot or more importantly, pulling the trigger, um, they see violence as a, le a less reasonable reaction to being disrespected. And what we, what we did was we used our knife and we made an incision in his left chest where the heart is. Cradle to Grave is not a scared straight program. There's, you know, nobody raises their voices. It's just narrating a story that is sad, um, but it is unfortunately too often a reality of growing up in a city like Philadelphia. Since 2002, uh, approximately 25,000 people have been shot in the city of Philadelphia. The number one weapon of choice is the nine millimeter. Somebody was shot every six and a half hours last year in Philadelphia. That 80% of people who get shot in Philadelphia actually survive being shot. Gun violence is contagious. It's like a disease. When somebody gets infected with it, it doesn't stay with them, they pass it along, right? One of the goals is to really spell out the consequences of being a victim of gunshot injury and talk about the debilitating injuries that they suffer. Among those are amputations or the fact that we see so many young men who are paralyzed as a result of a shooting. It is good that 80% of our gunshot victims live. And if you don't dive down into what that statement really means, then you kind of just move on. But it's kind of what are they living with and how are they living? So they're young, they have their whole lives ahead of them, and the wounds can be really devastating. From you know traumatic brain injury to paralyzed from the neck down where they know they're paralyzed and they can't move their arms and they can't move their legs and they're 20-something years old. 